that'll probably be uh, B where we are talking where are we going sounds nice let's turn that down a wee bit welcome everybody welcome on while well, we get uh, situated and I figure out how to work the internet ah YouTubes there we are ooh Live now. Let's. Uh, it's a good sign. Press that button and away we go. All right. Everyone, want to let us know how we're looking and how we're sounding. Uh, 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 uh. And welcome to the Genus Brewing live stream. This is a live stream that we do every single Sunday, uh, most Sundays at 8:45 Pacific Standard Time in the morning. And for those of you who haven't been here before, the general breakdown is we start with some news. Maybe toss in a little joke, uh, and then we go into a style of the week where we break down our favorite malts, hops, and yeasts to go with a certain style. And then we go into two discussion topics, which today we're talking about hot weather hacks. If you got hot weather, and that is a struggle for you to make beer, we're gonna we're gonna help you out here. That's what we're what we're here to do today. Well, so uh, yeah, yeah. There we go. Let's jump into it a little bit. Jump Genius on in. News. Uh, What's going on here? Yeah, so uh, we have a new schedule that is hopefully going to allow for uh, a little bit more filming. We've been getting pretty busy in the tap room, so filming during tap room hours hasn't really happened a lot. But starting this next week, we're going to try to be getting in here a couple days where we're here um, before we're open, kind of like we do with the live stream, and get a little bit of filming done. So hopefully that helps us get out some more regular videos besides just the live stream. I know some of you have been asking for that. So that's happening. Yeah. Uh, we made an awesome new uh, tap handle yesterday with our uh, oh, yeah. laser printer. That was fun. If you uh, follow us on Instagram, you might have seen some teasers on it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm pretty excited about that. And it's just Mark 1, but uh, eventually we'll be uh, going over how we make multiple types of tap handles using the same machine, and it'll be a, a whole big thing. We're pretty excited for it. That should be fun. We got an awesome new fridge. Uh, you can almost see it behind me. Yeah, it's there. Right now it's holding water, but it's uh, we're going to do a video on that, talking about different ways to uh, store and sell our beer. So that'll be a, a video coming up hopefully pretty soon. Yeah, and uh, we, get, we get a minion tomorrow. Yeah, which I'm super excited for. He's someone who can both brew beer and sell beer. So uh, we have a little bit more brewing capacity that we just got this last month, and so we're hiring somebody to kind of manage that extra capacity that we have. Um, Tim will still be the main brewer on our small batch stuff. He gets to do a lot of R&D, which will be super fun for him. But now we've got well. someone to do a little bit more uh, the big batch stuff, which will hopefully help us all have a lot more awesome beer. And he's going to help us get out in Spokane. So if you're in Spokane and you have a, a bar that's uh, aching for some better beer, feel free to to let them know that we have that capacity now yeah we can we can give them better beer yeah mm. uh, yeah oh the olympics is on the olympics is on there's been some uh interesting exciting and uh other things happening with that i don't know i read the news every day and it seems like there's always something going on yeah i was actually watching uh i was watching women's volleyball for the first time yesterday um it took me like five minutes five minutes in and there was a wrist injury already yeah, how was that? Well, it's feeling a lot better today, but uh, yeah, it was it was a shock. It's painful. It was painful. You can't overwork it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, <laughs> mark that one off. <laughs> All right. So uh, that means it's time for the beer of the week. Bum bum bum. Beer of the week. Yeah. And today's beer of the week I'm super excited for because it's a perfect hot weather beer, and we've had a lot of hot weather lately, uh, and that's going to be a saison. Mm, love saisons, and uh, I will say, I mean, saison is a delicious, delicious beer that uh, isn't necessarily a specific style. There's a little bit of range in there, which uh, makes it really fun to play around with. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize how uh, broad of a category of saisons can be. Like dark saisons, which I know a lot of people, a lot of breweries will brand darker saisons as a dark saison. That's not actually a separate category. It kind of all fits in. Yeah, uh, you know, it's fun. 
So, uh, Saison, let's get into this. Malt of the week for that. That's an interesting pick on there. Russian red wheat. So, a lot of people know that these uh, beers are going to be wheat heavier. They have a certain percentage of wheat. I went with Russian red wheat because it's got an extra graininess kind of component, and it's also going to be a higher protein than your standard white wheat. Um, Saisons are always going to finish dry. They are, uh, uh, most Saison yeast will produce, uh, they're diastatic, so they'll produce enzymes that break down longer chain starches. So, having a little extra protein for some bodybuilding, um, it can add some character to the final product you know and that should be something that you're looking for like peter said these are dry but you still want some good mouthfeel to it um and so. it talks about a little bit the end of the style breakdown but some saisons have bread in them too yeah. um if you are a brewer and you're doing a saison with bread uh, they made a category where you should enter that for their judging which is american wild ale but technically it's all still the same fits into the same farmhouse same funkiness farmhouse. yeah it's very interesting uh having the farmhouse designation being coming back encompassing the brett saisons the standard saisons uh as well as a few other beers so yeah uh hop of the week i like this one huel melon uh absolutely love 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 that hop and this is a great choice for this style yeah, it's a fun one because it is a it's a it's a noble uh, derivative or it's bred off of some noble hops, so it still has some of that classic uh, grassiness that you can get off like Saz and Hallertau. Uh, but it also has a distinct kind of white wine presence as well as that, as it's, the name suggests, that melony quality. So it's got a little fruitiness without being you know this giant hop bomb like mosaic where it's going to completely trash the beer. It's a nice fruity hop that actually will blend in with a funkier style. Yeah, absolutely perfect for it. No. Uh, yeast of the week, we have uh, either French Saison or uh, Jovaru. Uh, Hovaru, uh, Jovaru. Yeah, Jovaru. One of the two. No, Jovaru. <laughs> uh, I love both of them. French Saison is probably going to be my personal favorite. And if I'm doing any kind of beer that I want a little bit of that nice funkiness uh, from a, you know, Saison type yeast, French Saison is probably going to be my first choice absolutely love that yeast it's one of those ones that's also a killer strain and it's just it's it's aggressive if you're making a saison and you're not very good at brewing or you don't have good practices just add that french saison from it on the warm side and those two things will take care of your beer it'll taste good you can mess up a lot of other stuff and your beer will taste good oh yeah uh, another thing I also personally like about this is uh, it produces long chain or, um, it produces long chain flavor molecules in there so even though french saison will ferment out bone dry it still feels like there's a lot of body left over in this beer yeah does it glycerins that they produce something like uh, that glycerins so, poly polysaccharides no uh, no i think it's uh, it might be glycerin someone uh, someone fact check us and figure out what the what the what the word we're looking for is it's yeah. early in the morning and we have hangovers <laughs> I, that's not entirely untrue also if somebody wants a very delicious delicious drink costco uh at least for us right now costco has adult other pops Ooh. um they're alcoholic they're very delicious you throw that as your ice into your seltzer and it Ooh. tastes way better and adds alcohol it's delicious that's that Go sounds like it. a great idea actually yeah, it was last night um, someone's asking, they're in Seattle, uh, visiting Seattle. What's your favorite breweries to check out in Seattle? All right, this is not Seattle, but you know what? Most of the area is Seattle, uh, at least to me, because I don't go over there too much. Go up to Chuck and Nut and have some of the best goddamn beer of your life. Yeah. And I, I do mean that. Chuck and Nut is absolutely amazing. It is uh, a couple hours north of Seattle and Bellingham, so, you know, technically a different city. Um, I would also say going south a little bit in there. Three Magnets is phenomenal. Oh, Three Magnets is really good. Uh, I like the Stopian State as well as uh, Sig Brewing and Wet Coast are some of my favorites. Dystopian State, is that is that one near Fremont? Uh, no, that's actually, <laughs> that's in Tacoma. All of those are uh, in they're all, well, they're Tacoma all and then Gig Harbor for um, Wet Coast. Uh, oh no! Wait, Three Magnets is Olympia. So oh, yeah, okay. yeah, we're a little bit off here. Uh, we're sending you on some uh, some road trips here. Yeah, uh, although Seattle, Seattle proper, I mean Fremont. Fremont is an absolute must. You got to go there. They make amazing beer. 
Yeah. Um, Jimmy uh, recommended Fremont, which is why I, I went there. And I don't remember which ones were around it, but last time I went to Fremont, it was super busy, so I didn't even go into Fremont. But there was like five breweries within walking distance of Fremont that I went to, and probably three out of the five of them were just really, really good breweries. They're smaller yeah. breweries, kind of like us, which made them even more fun. I think Church Key is over by there uh, a little bit. And I haven't met a Church Key. There. Um, also, the Brewer's Cafe is really near Fremont. That is a Belgian-style beer cafe. I think they had something like 300 beers on tap, and I mean actually on tap. They have like three levels to the bar, and absolutely amazing food. You that know, what, while we're at it, while we're sending you all the way over to Olympia, just go on over, hop a ferry to Whidbey Island, hit up Reverend K. Wisebury, and uh, yeah, I forget what it's called, but... Yes, do that, and then also when you're on Whidbey, uh, drink some Hierophant uh, meat. Oh yeah, yeah, Hierophant round part two. That's right. They, yeah. they make some really good meats. Tell Jeremy uh, Genus sent you. He'll appreciate it. I'll probably give you a high five. He Maybe might. a kiss a in the mouth. high five. All right. Now that we've been <laughs> distracted on that, the other yeast of the week, the Javaru on that, I, this is a little bit new for us. We haven't used it too much. comes from Lithuania, the actual Javaru uh, brewery in Lithuania. Uh, phenomenal yeast. We yeah. used it in our grisette here. Absolutely love it. It's fun, and it's, uh, it is one that you do. So French Chazon can still produce pretty good beers fermented cold. Uh, the Jovaru or Yovaru, however you, everyone you, you want to pronounce it, uh, that one we do say you have to ferment that one hot. Like if yes. you don't get 75 or above, you're doing yourself a huge disservice. Um, it'll still be fine at cold temperatures, but it's just not going to produce all the yumminess that you want. Um, and the reason we're saying you know a style and some yeast that we want to ferment hot is as we're going to get into in topic number one of this week uh picking yeast that ferment hot is a really good way to kind of beat the heat yeah especially in the summer and produce very delicious things i mean brewers have been doing this for a long time making specific beers in specific seasons because of the weather yeah uh juvaru coming off on that yeast you're going to lose a lot of the really high spiciness that's going to be replaced by a little bit of lemon pithiness and that's phenomenal that would actually go really well with the uh, heel melons in there get a little bit more fruit character yeah um, let's talk a little bit more before we move on to the first topic let's talk a little bit more about the style of saison like yeah. i said before it's a very broad category um, characteristically it's going to finish uh it's going to finish high um, but it's also uh or sorry it's going to finish dry meaning there's not a lot of sugars left in it um, but it should be both uh, relatively highly carbonated no matter where it fits in the style and it should have some level of puffiness from a protein matrix that'll be left behind that's why we like to pick first of all any wheat at all although wheat isn't necessary it really helps that protein matrix and uh any, especially anything that's going to have a higher protein content so if you use like a higher protein pilsner malt for example you might not need the wheat but it's always going to give a little bit of that extra grainy flavor that I like. Yeah. Um, sorry, I got lost in a question, and you were just going on such a great, great ramble. You just there. got lost in my eyes. Oh, I did. Uh, well, somebody asked a question. We'll get to it there. Um, that's actually a question I probably know the answer to. But uh, so overall impression of this beer, and I mean, like, if you're looking at our notes, we have three pages, and this is literally the BJCP all printed out on notes on Saison. There is a lot here. It's probably one of the lengthiest ones just because of the flavor range that you can get. It's going to yeah. say, like, dry to not very dry, light to not very light. <laughs> <laughs> in all honesty, in there, um, you know, in... Uh, going into it, it like they, the overall impression is just a great description for this. It's most commonly pale. They're always highly refreshing, highly attenuated. Can be bitter, but not necessarily from hops. Uh, generally going to be a little bit stronger uh, in their moderate strength. Belgian French type ale, very dry. Uh, high carbonation in there using non-barley cereal grains. Uh, the, sorry, it is saying that uh, additional spices for complexity, on all honesty, the most traditional saisons might have had traditional spices in there, just being farmhouse beers, what's being produced might be going into the beer, but that, it, I would say it, adding extra spices m may not be necessarily appropriate. You usually should get right. that from the uh, yeast that you're using. So especially if you have a yeast that you're fermenting hot, that's going to create phenolics. 
Um, phenolics can come across depending on the yeast as clove-like, uh, but sometimes it can also come as like black pepper, which is really pleasant, or peppercorns. Oh, yeah. um, coriander notes. Sometimes it can be like a little bit of orange and spice from a combination of the esters and uh, phenols that are coming off your yeast. Uh, but there's a huge range, uh, and we picked two uh, more spicy yeasts on this that work well on hot temperatures. But if you use, for example, Belgian saison yeast, that would start to produce a lot of those fruitier Belgian esters, uh, which can make it perceive a little bit sweeter than a lot of saisons that you probably know and like are. Yeah. Uh, so on that, that, I mean, that's basically a lot of what you're looking for in this beer for overall everything is you're looking for a good, funky, spicy, fruity character coming from the yeast. A lot of the flavor is going to be yeast driven on it. They should always be super dry, but not necessarily be perceived as super dry, uh, as well as be highly refreshing. Uh, the Saison styles uh, developed on farms basically to feed farm workers. This was supposed to be something that after you're done working or you know on your lunch break that you're having a couple of them and it's super refreshing. And also because of the uh, non-barley cereal grains going into it, gives you some of those extra proteins and goodness to uh, keep going and keep working. And they're always going to have character, even on the lighter end of the alcohol spectrum. So to kind of run down where the alcohol is going to land, a table saison uh, or a grisette, something in that range, uh, can be 3.5 to 5%, which is very, very sessionable. And the nice thing about it is we've mentioned before, it's higher protein, which means even though it's going to be a dry beer, it's going to have some fullness. And because of all the extra phenols and esters that the yeast produce, it's also going to be a very flavorful beer, even at 3.5%. Uh, but you can get into kind of like a dark um, or a standard Saison, um, uh, which is going to be in that uh, 5 to 7% range. Uh, Saisons can very easily get up to 7 or above 7. Um, if we're going to categorize it in the BJCP world, though, when you get above 7%, 7 to 9.5% is going to be super quote unquote. Um, but that's the range, 3.5 to 9.5. Like I said, this is a huge range of beers. Um, you can also go as dark as 22 uh, SRM and as light as 5 SRM, which is very pale. So you got pale and dark and you got light and super saisons. That's kind of the range that we're working with. Um, and this categorization is something that just happened post 2015. So they didn't, it all was one big category of like farmhousey style beers. And now they're kind of trying to separate it into like, all right, let's make a dark and let's make a light version. So, um, but historically yeah. this is whatever. No, again, it's a farmhouse beer developed in farmhouses. Uh, every farmhouse had a little bit of a different recipe going into it. Uh, so they all ended up just a little bit different depending on what everybody performed at that in particular farmhouse. Yeah. Um, it is actually good to uh, denote on here that the farmhouse ale category is not an actual category. That is something in the U.S. that we have started to develop to call uh, farmhouse produce beers, particularly of the Belgian region. Yeah. Uh, most of the time in Europe, they still refer to them as Saison because farmhouse is much more broader thought of category, not in particular to more of the Saison style. Yeah, and farmhouse could be an amber. It's 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 literally whatever. Uh, we've kind of started calling them Saisons and American Wild Ales, um, which is what Americans think of as farmhouse beers, but it's mm. It's a little bit of a, of a jarring nomenclature because it uh, automatically assumes funkiness. Because uh, when I do, do a flavor descriptor, I'll say farmhousey. That's a flavor mm -hmm. descriptor for me. Like it smells like alfalfa, smells like a barn. Um, but really, I mean, it's although it's a good flavor descriptor, if you call it that, it doesn't mean a lot. I mean, a lot of British beers also developed in farmhouses. So yeah. if we use that the notion, they would also be called farmhouse. And it kind of defeats that nice funky character from Saison. Uh, and going along with that, traditionally there probably was Brett present in it. Uh, but if you do use Brett in these beers, you're looking for the funk from the Brett. You're not looking so much for the acid coming on it. Uh, the uh, Saison yeast itself does produce a little bit of tartness in there, but these are not sour beers. They're not tart beers. There's just a little kick of that. And if you have Brett in it, it should be about the funk coming out of there yeah uh, as well as a little bit of the fruit you you don't want to have the brett producing acid yeah um 
Yeah, so let's. Uh, I think that pretty much covers. I mean, Cassé is on such a broad category. If you've got questions on it, feel free to leave them. Uh, let's hit a couple of questions and comments that we've got so far, and then jump into topic number one. All right, not quite on this. Coming back to this question, Joel. Speaking of fermenting hot, I brewed American wheat with quike, added peach and melon in the secondary. It tastes good, but smells funny. Any idea why? Yes, the melon. Um, I've done quite a few melon ferments, and a lot of the time they come out smelling a little bit cheesy almost a little bit butyric or that kind of uh, baby barf baby diaper um smell that's in there i've had uh, actually amazing cider it was a uh, honeydew cider and the flavor was just phenomenal but right up there over the nose was that cheesiness i do notice it in watermelon beers when people ferment out the actual watermelon itself instead of using flavor there's a tiny undertone of that kind of little bit of weird cheesiness. So I would be willing to bet that where your uh, funny smell is coming from is probably actually the melon in there. Mr. Hayden wants to see the new tap handle, and I need another beer. So let's get a couple more questions in, and I'll go, yeah. I'll go do that. Go pull one from the uh, fridge, because somebody 100% remembered to bring a uh, Brett Saison beer. It happened totally later today just not on film all right the but, funky uh, the funky flavor that's probably from the melon by the way with age will probably go away um or at least dissipate a little bit yeah um it does dissipate a little bit you can do some things to uh, um encompass that into better flavors my trick was throwing britannomyces at it because brett loves to eat everything and turn it into numbiness but i also loves to what i don't know you you had it yesterday well, I could have. All right. Uh, do, 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 do. Oh, here you go. Do people, uh, Yeast and the Beast, do people still send us beer? Not often enough. So you should. We sell tons of backstore of it, but yeah, not often enough. Yeah, yeah um, you should send us more. Deliciousness. No. Definitely. Uh, <laughs> and if you live in a ranch style house, yes, you can brew some ranch style beers, and they should 100% have some Hidden Valley in it. Hidden Valley. It would be amazing. Uh, Jimmy, uh, no, we do not have any of the seasonal white yeast on hand as we speak, but we're going to have to do a white yeast order pretty Probably soon. Did. So, uh, we can get some in. Yeah, there's a great chance we might get some in. We should grab some Bartleby from Imperial, too. Ooh, yes. Raise your hand if you want some Bartleby yeast. Sold. We're getting Bartleby. All right. Uh,. Where do we go? Why do we keep uh, tap handles in the fridge? To keep them cold, Mr. Hayden. Like, that was a silly question. They need to be fresh and crispy. Brew. Oh, Greg H. Brewed an IPA with Lollamon Verdant, uh, pitched at 70F. Uh, on the second day, got up to 80F. Is it ruined? Probably not, actually. That yeast can uh, handle a little bit of a hotter temperature. I mean, you should, if you can, ramp it or see if you can get it back down. It will definitely produce a lot more fruity flavors at that heat. But you probably haven't ruined it yet. Taste it. See if it tastes good. If it does, drink it. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, Nocturnal Brewer. Uh, Saison providing elevated levels of glycerin. What does the glycerin do? And could you add glycerin to ramp up the effects? Fullness and perception of sweetness. Exactly that. Actually, there is a lot of glycerin, to, uh, excuse me, there's a lot of the times glycerin is added to uh, distilled liquors to make it seem fuller, not so thin, and add some perceived sweetness uh, to those liquors. In fact, that's one of the things that makes vodka vodka. Vodka is not unflavored, it's not an adulterated straight pure liquor. You actually do some things to it. And one of them is adding the glycerin for the perceived sweetness and body. Uh, and what happens in the saisons for that is even those these things can be bone dry and they can ferment out even all the way down to 1.000 gravity. Generally, it's a little bit higher than that, but they can ferment down that far. What that glycerin will do is make the Saison still feel like it's got a lot of body in your mouth, uh, as well as adding some perceived sweetness so it actually doesn't taste as dry as they generally are. 
Here's a fun question from A. Joyce. How would an English Dark Mild sell in the tap room? Need more Dark Milds. Uh, low crushing a stein. Love, I'm guessing is what he's trying to say. Crushing a stein, a 4.5% beer. I totally agree with you. Uh, here's, the, uh, here's the facts, though. If you were to make a perfect English style beer of any style, so it could be a Dark Mild, it could be a perfect DSB, it could be a bitter. Um, you could have it on cask, and it would probably get outsold by a seltzer that you add a lot of flavor to. That is true. Um, unfortunately, and not really sure where you're at, uh, for a lot of the American scene, making an actually really good quaffable uh, English pub beer, like a mild on that, just doesn't sell very well. The low alcohol, people don't tend to go after that, uh, as well as that nice, easy flavor. It's a little bit of a harder sell in a tap room. You could definitely do it. You can, uh, you know, build a... Uh, reputation around doing those things and bring people in uh, excuse me actually uh, who is it e9 in Seattle oh there's another good brewery over there e9 um, it's a blood orange pale by the way or blood orange Trappist beer blood orange Trappist blood orange pale blood orange okay. pale ale from the pale I think it's from the dude that uh, works at the tool company Ooh, the, the nice. oh yeah the snap fit tool company the snap fit guy yeah he's really nice um, yeah, so uh, there, uh, there actually is a, a phenomenal brewery over in uh, Seattle. Uh, I want to say E9, but I might be wrong on that. That only does true, like, cask-style English beers, and it's phenomenal. Drink them. It's a harder sell, and you probably will sell a lot more just having a great seltzer on tap. But yeah. that doesn't mean don't do it, because you should be making delicious beer. I think this got oxidized a little bit. Probably. It tastes like it was good, but I think it got oxidized, so I'm probably going to skip most of this. I'm going to take a couple drinks for good measure. While we go on to topic number one, although we have a good question from Revan, K, Revan KY. Brewed a double batch of our flagship Keller beer. One smells like sour metal, and the other uh, is awesome. It has awesome and has a peanut butter finish. Peanut butter finish usually, to me, comes from uh, a lot of proteins, and so it's either uh, high-protein grist that was done relatively raw or didn't fully break out the proteins in boil, or from enzyme producing yeast or any sort of enzymes that are left over throughout fermentation. Um, that's where I usually get that from. Uh, and we've definitely taken things that had that kind of peanut buttery finish, that almost double crackery finish, mm -hmm. and we've turned them into peanut butter beers, or we've just kind of left the crackeriness and let it kind of drop out some proteins and go from peanut butter to like a dry cracker, which is kind of fun. Um, but uh, the sour metal, no idea on that one. Probably mm. came from an infection, but maybe not. Hopefully not. Especially on the big scale, it's kind of hard if you're doing really good yeast pitches. Yeah, um, could could have been uh, oxidation on there. I know metal flavor, or tinny flavors can come from malt mm. oxidation or hot side oxidation. I think that bottle was too full, is what I think happened. And if bottles are too full, a lot of people don't know this. If bottles are too full, then um, it actually makes the bottle seal less effective. So having a little bit of headspace actually helps the bottle cap seal better. And so that one was, uh, uh, that was oxidized. So i uh, going to say this real quick. Captain Kerberos is right. Machine house brewing in Georgetown, uh, is the English, uh, English cask brewery that I'm thinking of. And the guy who's asking about breweries in Seattle, go to the machine house. It will be stupidly delicious. Also, while you're in Georgetown, go to Georgetown Brewing and taste all you want. They don't sell beer to like drink while you're there. They only give you tasters as much as you want until you buy a growler and move on. They and do sell to-go package stuff too, right? Yeah, they do sell. Everything is to-go there. You just get the tasters, but you, you get tasters. You yeah. can spend all day doing tasters. And then there. you buy a six-pack to bring back to us. Exactly. Um, um, Let's jump into topic number one before we get too caught up in questions. We'll do plenty of Q&A at the end. Um, but uh, topic number one is going to be tip for brewing, tips for brewing in hot weather. If this sounds interesting to you or you think we're going to have some good tips and you want our tips, then hit the, the thumbs up button. You should definitely smash the tips. Uh, smash uh, smash tips. the like button. Slap the tips. <laughs> that, that works. That works too. Um, so brewing in hot weather can come, can uh, provide challenges in a couple different ways. The two main ways that people will see are going to be fermentation temperature, especially if you're using not very tolerant uh, yeast. Um, and the other is uh, uh, groundwater. So a lot of people are using water uh, in some capacity to chill their wort before going into fermentation. Um, and so groundwater being really hot can also be an 
issue, especially in places like Arizona uh, or even here in Spokane when it gets hot enough, our groundwater gets really warm and it takes a lot longer to chill down beer. So here are tips for both of those. Um, we've kind of already mentioned this first one and it's, I know a lot of brewers out there. I watch a lot of other brew, brewing YouTubers that will say their number one rule is fermentation temperature, which I disagree with. Um, uh, and that comes from working with a lot of home brewers that come in that are brand new home brewers. And instead of trying to convince them that they need to work on fermentation temperature right off the bat, we always say, work on finding yeasts that are going to work with your system. So we're always about building the best beers you can with what you have before adding on stuff. And that's going to be a great lesson for everybody. It's kind of what we go into all the time. Mm. If you perfect your process, it really doesn't matter environment or ingredients. You can make phenomenal beer as long as the process for making that beer is great. Yeah. So when you don't have temperature control, there is no reason to go out and spend a couple hundred dollars to try and make a fermentation chamber when you could just shift your idea mindset on the brewing and pick ingredients and yeast that will work in those specific temperature ranges. Uh, here's a great example. If you want to brew an IPA, um, there's a lot of different hacks to brewing IPAs with warm fermentation temperatures. And the first one that I discovered when I was a very, very young brewer and I fell in love with the style um, with a green flash beer, and I think you probably know where I'm going when I say green flash, mm. is the Belgian IPA. Because uh, Belgian IPAs have a delicious bubblegummy, sometimes almost strawberry fruitiness uh, that can help push forward a lot of hot flavors. And so, um, what was the name of the green flash? La Freak? Uh, La Freak. Yeah, yeah, so Green Flash with La Freak was the first time I saw that combination of flavors, just amazing fruitiness from the yeast, plus amazing fruitiness from the hops, and a little bit of bitterness from the hops. And that's something you can ferment at 75, 80 degrees really, really easily. And if it free rises above that, it's really not a big deal because it's going to produce a lot of the great esters that are going to help balance your beer. And when we're saying Belgian IPA on there, uh, we're picking specific <clears throat> yeast to go along with this for specific things. You're not using a whip beer yeast to do this. Right. Uh, you're actually not looking for a lot of the high phenolics. So even uh, Belgian Saison might be a little too aggressive for it, where the French Saison or the Jovaru Saison, our farmhouse yeast, may be a little bit better. Yeah. Uh, personally, I like using Arden in it. Arden is very fruity, very bubblegummy, can ferment hot, still drops out clear. And what we're trying to avoid is that clove flavor because that clove flavor is a very pungent phenol and that pungent phenol can really combat the hops. So uh, we're picking yeasts, uh, like we mentioned, the French Saison, uh, the Jovaru, um, the Arden strain, uh, and there's a handful of hot, uh, Trappist strains too that mm. will produce a lot of that great flavor um, without that phenol. Or with new innovations in yeast, you can go with something like Sundew. Yeah, Sundew has the uh, phenol clipped off of it. Uh, genetically speaking, the phenol producer was clipped off of there, so it only produces the Belgian bubblegummy and fruitiness coming out of there. And we've done a couple <clears throat> of IPAs with it, and it's oh, yeah. beautiful, beautiful. Just red, ripe berry fruit coming out of it. Uh, if you don't already know, Sundew is a uh, fun new yeast from Omega that we did a video on a while ago. Now, speaking of Omega, Omega, let's say you're still trying to go on that IPA range, but you really want to do a nice like West Coast style IPA. You want a nice neutral base. They have another yeast that's awesome for that. Yeah, uh, and that will be Quike, uh, a specific strain of Quike on there, Lutra. Um, and Quike, we'll get into that in a, little, a little bit after this. Uh, Lutra is stupidly clean, clean Quike yeast. Still performs like Quike, ferments hot, ferments fast, hot, and heavy, uh, but it's clean. It, it's my preferred clean use over a Chico strain or anything like that. Uh, yeah, uh, and all the Quikes are going to be able to ferment upwards of 95 100 degrees so uh there's you're really not going to have a lot of um you know a lot of uh better options if you live in a really really warm area and don't have air conditioning basically so quike can there's always a strain of quike for what you're trying to do mm -hmm. and so going into that quikes uh, all around quikes are great for this using any other quike for ipas are awesome because they add a lot of fruity flavors uh the voss strain hornadol is actually quite great quite great ah. for this 
Yeah, uh, it's quite great for this because it produces a lot of those mango and peachy flavors. Uh, in their hot head from Omega is actually great because it's fairly neutral, but you're still getting some really good fruit flavors coming out of it. Uh, and in fact, I think we had a question here about uh, differences. Oh yeah, T-Man asked the difference between Verdant and Voss for an IPA. Uh, in, well, Verdant, Ver, Verdant's not a quite strain. So Verdant uh, can ferment really warm, um, or relatively warm, but it's like room temperature warm, like yeah. 72 warm. Whereas Voss uh, at 95 will still produce a relatively clean beer, uh, but it's going to throw some nice tangerine notes to it. So if you build your, your beer around that, let's say you're adding Amarillo, for example, um, you build a nice orangey, maybe a little bit of dankness around it kind of base. Uh, and Voss is definitely going to be your better bet at that hotter temperature. Mm -hmm. But if you're sitting in an air conditioned room and you've got a nice spot to put your beer, that Verdant IPA is a really good IPA uh, yeast. Verdant is an English strain basically on that. Yeah. So if you push that a little bit too hot, it will produce some, uh, well, actually we haven't done the experiment of fermenting it too hot yet, but yeah. like most English strains, it will, can get a little bit fusely if it goes too hot. It also can get overly fruity if it goes too hot on there. So if you're hitting in the, uh, you know, upper, upper ranges, definitely quite Voss is going to be a much, much better choice. And is quikes are awesome choices for warm fermenting. That's kind of how they developed. Yeah. Someone's asking if there's a dry packet yeast for a Belgian IPA. I've actually haven't done a lot with dry packet Belgian strains. Um, I believe uh, Fermentus has one, but I don't know which one it is. Uh, um, T58 or S yeah. S oh uh, what is it S33 that can the go kind of warm. The brown package is a Trappist. Yeah, that one might produce clove though. Yeah, T58 yeah. might be. T58's a little Saisani, but uh, I think I've seen people use it. But the S33, I know people have used that for Irish and Belgians. I have no idea what its temperature range is, but I know a lot of people have used that for hazies. So uh, maybe that one goes up a little bit warmer. I'm not 100%. Like I said, we haven't done a lot with dry yeasts and Belgian strains. We don't do, not that we do a lot of Belgians in general, but. Um, we usually use liquid when you do, just because we have a lot of Belgian liquid yeast that are going old, because not a lot of people brew out Belgians, and we always try to keep them on hand. So usually we're yeah. just going to reach for a, a three-month-old packet of Belgian liquid yeast and use that. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and while we're talking about that, Greg H, uh, is popping on <clears throat> Belle Saison works well for a farmhouse IPA. That is a Belgian Saison strain, and the only thing that I would say on that is be careful not to go too hot, because you will produce the clove coming out of that. Uh, that is a strain that does produce clove, and if you get a little bit too aggressive with it, on the clove part anyway, that's going to really detract from the hops. Uh, although Pel Saison may not, it's kind of an interesting fermenter Yeah. on that. So, good, I mean, it's a great one. Go for it. Try it. Do it. Um, uh, last thing to mention on when it comes to picking your yeast and, you know, knowing your fermentation temperatures is, uh, especially if you're doing 10 gallons or larger, but even on the 5-gallon scale, you do have to expect a temperature free rise. So let's say, you know, your air conditioning, air conditioner is chugging along. You can get your house down to like 75, for example. Really, you got to be expecting at least during peak fermentation, your beer is going to be fermenting at closer to 78 degrees. Um, so play around with that. And uh, when you're deciding your yeast, um, 75 might be passable for some English strains or some IPA strains, but realistically, it's on the upper echelon. And so switching to, you know, either a quike or a uh, saison yeast that can ferment a little bit hotter is going to be a good choice if you're if you're kind of on that upper border. Uh, Marte, thank you so much for the super chat. I appreciate it. Uh, GG. Well, uh, he asked a question a little bit further up. Look at that. Think about it. While I say this for IPA strains, if you have uh, if you cannot get your temperature below 80 degrees and you really want to make a nice hazy, juicy, fruity. Uh, IPA, then in, or uh, Sac Trois um, in Imperial. That's the citrus strain. Uh, I think in Omega, it's the Imperial or uh, sorry, uh, tropical IPA strain. But Sac Trois ferments phenomenally at 80 to mm -hmm. 90 degrees. Uh, there was a while that we thought that this strain was Brett. We thought it was a Britannia Myces strain because it produces all of those good fun, fruity, a little bit funky flavors. It's super attenuating on that. We'll ferment almost everything out and it likes it hot and heavy. That might be a perfect, if you have like that 75 to 80 degree range, just naturally, that might be the perfect yeast for you actually for IPAs. 
Uh, yeah. Marte, I brewed a five-gallon hazy IPA, added 0.5 uh, pounds of acidulated malt at mash out. pH was 6.8. I added 0.5 mils of lactic acid before boiling. pH still so 6.7. How do I fix a situation like this or avoid it? Or does it really matter? Um, I have a sneaking suspicion that your pH meter needs to be either recalibrated or it's not reading correctly. Um, or if you're using strips, maybe it's just a different accuracy with the reading, but even with a, let's say you have really, really hard water and your pH is like, I don't know, I guess it's possible to have it really, really hard, but like, your, let's say your pH is 8.1 naturally and you've got 200 parts per million of bicarbonate, even a standard really, really light grist, um, should be getting your pH below six. It's t- it would take very, very alkaline water to have all the acidity in, your, in a grist, leave your mash at 6.7 or 6.8, especially with the acid malt. And so. I would um, I would probably say that it's going to be a water calibration thing, or a, yeah. uh, it's a pH meter calibration, calibration thing. On there, uh, that would be the first thing to check, um, and then beyond that, I mean, you know, if you need it lower, you need to add some <clears throat> acids, but you need to make sure you're not hitting flavor threshold, or just turn it into a sour beer and add all the acid. Yeast and the bees. Here's a really good question. Do you have to worry about hop aromas boiling off when you ferment warm? And the answer is yes and no. You just kind of have to know your system. Again, it's knowing processes. Um, so a great option to help this is obviously pressure fermentation, uh, fermenting in a closed system where your aromas won't volatilize. They won't, they won't boil off. Um, the other option and what I did when I still did open ferments for my Belgian IPAs, which by the way is phenomenal for, uh, the character that the yeast produces with open ferments. When I did open ferments with my Belgian IPAs, uh, I would always just rely on a really heavy dry hop. It's one of the few times that I say a really nice, heavy dry hop, especially if you can do it in a closed dish system. And this would be not a biotransformation dry hop usually, but a late addition dry hop, even a cold side addition dry hop. Um, it's going to be really, really appropriate. And a lot of these Belgian yeasts naturally won't produce diacetyl. So you don't have the same hop creep risk that you do using, let's say an English strain with a late edition dry hop. So, um, that's one of the few times where I say a lot of people, even beginning brewers can still rely on a pretty successful late edition dry hop or cold side dry hop is when they're doing a Belgian IPA. Yeah. Um, so let's go on to our, uh, second point here. That's kind of going into our first point is expect fermentation free rise in these Uh, a lot of these yeast and especially when you get warmer yeast likes to be hang on wee 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 uh yeast likes to be that guy was in a hurry i mean god he ran that red light and everything uh yeast likes to uh ferment a lot more aggressively when it's warm on this so you can expect your fermentation temperature to free rise more aggressively than it would normally and you have to be aware of that yeah um something like a a saison strain for example like let's say we get up into that 75 to 80 degree range um whereas an english strain as an example if you're fermenting at 68 it might only free rise one to two maybe three degrees um that uh uh, Saison strain might get the entire beard done in a day or two, but during mm. that it might be three to five degrees that it, it free rises. Yeah. The more aggressive your yeast is going, the hotter it's going to make your wort beer. So just expect that, be aware of it, and choose your yeast accordingly. If you're sitting at 72 degrees, maybe using an English strain probably isn't the best because you're probably going to at least hit 75, maybe 78 in there. So switching or switching that into one that can be more tolerant at those higher temperatures. Jimmy J, here's a good question. With the wine type hops like Halletau Blanc, Nelson Sauvin, um, and Hul Melon's going to be another one of those. There's a couple of uh, New England style ones that are that white winey as well. Mm-hmm. Um, would they be good for a Belgian IPA? And the answer is yes. Those are probably my favorite hops for dry hopping in general or relying on a dry hop, a late edition dry hop. Um, not a biotransformation dry hop because of the total oil content. Um, but yeah, those are those are really good. Just don't rely on those hops for the entirety of the boil for a Belgian IPA. I like to have something with a little higher total oil and a little bit more pungence behind it, at least backing those up. Um, I've done some with Nelson Sauvin where like, let's say I'm doing a, a 10 to 12 ounce hot bill, maybe seven or eight ounces of that is gonna be the Nelson Sauvin. And then two or three is gonna be something with a higher total oil. I think the last time I did it, I did like Belma or something like that, which is not a super high, but higher total oil. Yeah. Uh, actually, going into the uh, hot yeast that we haven't talked about yet, Hefeweizen strains. Diego Mendez is uh, talking about this. Hefeweizen strains are actually pretty decent to uh, you, uh, yeah. do during hot for weather. Hazies. yeah. And also for hazies. Bonanza. 
Bonanza from Dude. Omega. Uh, that ha- is another one where they have gone in and clipped off the phenol producer, so it produces the banana fruit flavor rather than the clove banana bread flavor coming out of it. And I will tell you, that was probably one of our most popular hazy IPAs that we did. You couldn't necessarily get banana banana out of it, but it gave it this wonderful tropical fruit juice flavor. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, let, well, let's uh, keep continue on. We got a couple more questions that we'll make sure we try to get to at the end, but I do want to move on a little bit mm-hmm. since we got two topics to try to hit. Um, so uh, we talked a bit before about how a lot of uh, brewing YouTubers will mention temp control. There are a lot of great hacks depending on your price range to do uh, for temperature control if you need to use a lower temperature yeast. Obviously not a lager yeast. It's going to be difficult unless you have a lagering chamber. Um, but something you can do, it's really, really easy to do, is uh, run cold water periodically in a bathtub. So have a bathtub that you periodically semi-drain and semi-refill uh, and just have that cold water. It's a it's a cheap resource for you. Um, there's going to be natural evaporation in the bathtub. It's a, such a high surface area um, that it'll keep that area a little bit cooler. The downside is because of moisture, it's going to be a great medium for um, bacterial growth. So you do have to make sure that you're in a very, very closed system with using uh, the bathtub. Yeah. Um, along <clears throat> with that, using water is a great way to actually have temperature control if you have a you know a cooler or a small tub horse trough that you can sit your fermenter in there and have recirculating water moving water going around it and making sure that you're always keeping that on the cool side for it the evaporation as well as the cool water is going to take a lot of heat out of there, keep it more stable. But again, when you're using it, this is a great petri dish of stuff to grow. So make sure you're sanitary and closed. Uh, speaking of evaporation, Kevin Rabe just gave a, uh, a good tidbit that I've told a lot of people before too. Um, using a moist t-shirt that you throw over your carboy, for example. It's actually, t-shirts are perfect for that carboy because they've got the, the head hole for the neck of the carboy. Mm-hmm. Uh, moist t-shirt with a, uh, a fan just a little fan blowing on the moist t-shirt and you just re-moisturize it every once in a while uh, the specific heat or the heat of evaporation uh, for water is very very high so that evaporation is going to constantly be pulling heat away from your fermenting so just to keep something cool that is a good hack that is a great hack if you need it to be a little bit cooler on that get the wet t-shirt on there put a fan in front of it and just have that moving air hitting the t-shirt that evaporation will come off it works a lot like a swamp cooler yeah the downside to that the only downside to that is that it's really hard to really dial in what that temperature is going to be but if you just need a couple degrees off it's a great way to go great way to go um We've talked a little bit about already just, you know, sticking it in an air-conditioned room. Um, that's pretty obvious. Uh, the other thing is a fridge. So any sort of fridge um, that you can pseudo temperature control um, is going to work really well too. If you've got, you can find old fridges on, on Craigslist for like 50 bucks. Um, so when in doubt, that's a good place to look too. There's not too much beyond it besides getting just a fridge and a $25 temperature controller from Anvil. Um, but yeah, that's a good, uh, a good, Good use good as well. Good way to go. Uh, you can do that in a little chest freezer as well <clears throat> uh, and create your own fermentation chamber. Yeah. That's what we, a lot of people use uh, for fermentation chambers for lagers specifically. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about, here's something that that's really, really difficult is for a lot of people with hot groundwater, getting, um, getting their wort chilled down to the appropriate temperature before it goes into their fermenter. Because a lot of times you're not just battling the ambient heat that you're fermenting in, you're battling actually getting your wort down cold enough before you add your yeast. Because as soon as your yeast gets active, they're going to be trying to heat something up and it's going to be a lot harder to cool it down. So getting that beer cold is going to be good for two reasons. First of all, your yeast is going to be starting in a more appropriate condition. And second of all, uh, oxygen solubility is going to be a lot higher when your wort is cold. And so it's really important to keep that wort or get that wort cold before you add your yeast. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> great way to do this. It's actually something that we do when it gets too hot, like the uh, heat wave that we had. We'll take one of our fermenters, fill it up with water, and because we have it uh, glycol chilled, we will chill down that water and then use it to pump through our wort chiller and have cold, cold water to go through our wort chiller. Obviously at home, it's a little bit harder to do that, you know, if you don't have a glycol chiller, but 
getting some of your water if you're doing an immersion chiller coming through there getting some of that water putting it into the fridge or freezer first and getting it super cold before you use it is a great great way to do this and that's something that i did on the homebrew scale even before you know getting into the commercial brewing world when i was in there summer and i would just gravity feed it through my wort chiller and that works just fine it actually will slow the water down to make sure it has time to pick up more heat now but yeah you get a couple of jugs of cold water uh throw it in a bucket uh, if you've got any ice in your freezer you can add that to the bucket uh and then you gravity f feed it through either your immersion or your counterflow chiller um, and use that to chill down your water. Uh, if you're using super, super cold water, it's going to chill down your beer a lot faster than if you're using, you know, 80 degree groundwater. So exactly. And gra gravity does work. It doesn't need to be like pumping through out of a hose. It doesn't need to be in a limited supply of water. Uh, you do probably need about 10 gallons though. Yeah. At least it's, it, it takes a lot of water to do that, <coughs> but you can also supplement if you're using an immersion chiller, maybe starting out with three, four gallons of the ice cold water to uh, get it down to where you need it. And then switching over to the warm ground water to finish it out all the way. Yeah. You know, that's definitely a possibility and something that you can do. And if you're willing to spend the money and you want to invest in building a really good brewery, a big home brewery that's efficient and can do everything you want, um, glycol chillers have come down quite a bit in price. Uh, the ones that we sell here in the shop and that we kind of swear by that we use here in the back of our brew house are the brew built ones. You can find those on morebeer.com. It's not sponsored. We just really like the product because we like brew built as a brand because they've brought down the prices of a lot of things lately. Um, their glycol chillers, I want to say, are like six fifty for uh, a two a two, two port glycol chiller. Comes plumbed already with a pump, temperature controller, and everything. And then I want to say like nine hundred for the four um, out port one. But um, that price used to be two thousand dollars. And so, if you want to start really building that perfect uh, brewery uh, at home, then uh, a, an actual glycol chiller is going to go a long way. It's going to be super helpful. <clears throat> yeah. All right, we got uh, time for topic number two. Yeah, well, are we going to hit a couple of cues? A couple of cues. Uh, used to use a desktop fan. Yeah, I got a good one. Uh, Dave Dempster did a raw ale after a video, put it on tap two days ago. It's not carbonated fully, but the mouthfeel from samples are very different. They have a smooth and slight slick taste. Is this expected? Was it a heavy oat bill raw ale? Would be my first question to see whether or not that could be a part of it. Um, in which case, yeah, there's a lot of slickness that's going to come off oats that would normally uh, volatilize or break down in the boil that won't if you don't boil. Um, some high protein malts can do that too. So it really kind of depends on your grist. If you're using a pretty neutral grist, then it shouldn't be just from the fact that it's raw. Ooh, that smells funky. Yeah. Uh, you, oh, that's a Thomas. It's a Thomas, I yeah. It yeah. Is, yeah. I think it's maybe smoked. Mm, delightful. Uh, so 99 yeah. people are currently watching. Let's get to that 100 point. Nice. Also, everybody like the video right now. Right now. Uh, so, yeah, that depends on your uh, mash bill on there. If you're using things with high protein contents, high fat contents like the oats, yeah, 100%. You're not boiling it. Those are not precipitating out. So they're going to be left in there. But it it should be due to your malt bill more so than rawness. Um, there's also ways to break that down. Um, yeah, or break those down during fermentation just using a lot of the enzymes that we suggest. That said, over enzyming can also add some of some interesting proteininess too. So if you use too much mm -hmm. enzymes or too heavy of a, uh, of a dose of the enzymes that we recommend to break those down, then the enzymes themselves can also add some of that stuff. Uh, Randy, uh, <clears throat> what would you tell someone that gave you their homebrew that was undrinkable gross? Um, well, at least you tried. No, no, I mean, be honest with them. If it's undrinkable gross, just be like, uh, yeah, I can't do this. This is why. Um, if you want to try to lay on the super, super niceness, you can be like, ah, it could just be my palate. I'm super sensitive to butyric acid and infected beer. But um, you, you, can, you can play it the nice way, but honestly, a lot of homebrewers are going to appreciate if you're honest with them. If they're the kind of homebrewer that's doing it to get better at the craft, then they definitely will. Uh, that said, I do know a lot of homebrewers that just brew because it's a cheap way to get beer. And they probably don't want to hear that. So it kind of depends on the nature of the person. But if it's undrinkable, if also ask them if they like it. Ask them what they think about it first. And then maybe judge your, uh, your response that way. But we're usually pretty honest when it comes to people 
giving us homebrew. If we can't drink it, we can't drink it. Yeah, it, and it's one of those things like that, don't attack the beer. Just be like, all right, I I can't drink this because these flavors coming out of it I really don't like, and I think uh, you know are inappropriate or this might be a brewing flaw. Hey, what's your process to go into it? So yeah. uh, pulling stuff out and actually having, I don't like this in beers rather than, man, you just gave me a disgusting beer is always a better way to go. Yeah. Um, Jump Jasper, what's the advantages between water and glycol? And can you mix the two? Uh, you actually do always mix the two. So pure glycol doesn't have the heat capacity, so it doesn't uh, can't absorb as much heat or take away as much heat as water can water freezes glycol doesn't so usually what you're doing is you're aiming for like a 30 percent glycol to 70 percent water mixture depending on how cold you want that um, so it kind of depends on your system but uh, you will always be mixing the water and glycol yeah uh captain kerberos uh brewing with imperial b44 whiteout which is a wit style uh yeast for a wit got really excited overflowed my fermenter airlock twice is the yeast loss from this blowover going to affect the overall fermentation? Let's start out with that uh, wit beer yeast is a top cropping yeast and it loves to create a huge, huge krausen on top of that. So having the blowovers is kind of normal for that yeast. Um, theoretically, it shouldn't affect your brew too much depending on what happened during that. If you took off airlocks and sanitized and cleaned them, there is actually a potential for infection because you broke the system. Most of the time, you just have a mess. Um, Ruindu Gunata Lake. Can saisons be dark? I know historic saison styles are pretty brownish brews. Uh, yeah, we've talked about that a little bit, but the uh, the, the SRM range from saisons historically is as light as 5 SRM, which is very, very light, and as dark as 22 SRM, which is brown, and some porters are even 22 SRM. So, yeah, it's a pretty wide range. Uh, Ribbon yeah. KY, Genus, how about the small plate chiller that is affordable and able to be taken apart and cleaned? I haven't used plate chill chillers for a long time, other than the giant one that we have down at the steel barrel. Um, I know the Chiron one was a really cheap option for a long time. They're like, you know, 90 bucks or something like that. And they do a pretty good job, but I haven't seen a lot of the small options for that. Yeah. Uh, one of my biggest problems with plate chillers is that they can clog super easy just because all the tolerances are so tight on that, uh, as well as the fact that they are <clears throat> really hard to clean. Uh, so if you can take it apart and clean it, like, you know, there you go, do it. It's, um, it's a good way to go. If you're asking us which one it is, then you probably need to do some shopping. Uh, Carter West is, ask, is asking about mangoes. Uh, it's a good question. We do have a lot of tips, but uh, we're going to go ahead and get on to topic number two so we can speed run through that real quick and then hopefully get to that question after that. So topic number two, this is speaking of summer beers and it kind of ties in. We're going to be talking about shandies and rattlers. Um, mm. First of all, everyone comment. What, what do you think about shandies and rattlers? Are they something that you enjoy? Do you think they're a bastardization of beer? Um, is it something you'd be willing to try or might try? Um, because kind of what we're going to go over is, first of all, what they are, how they're made, things like that, and why a lot of people use them versus can they actually be a, a beer style that's worth doing? Can you elevate Shandies and Rattlers? Can you make them a, uh, a unique and complex thing? So Let's start off <clears throat> with the first. Are Shandies and Rattlers different, or are they the same thing? Um, so uh, I think the consensus here is that with a uh, Shandy, you're adding sugar to your beer as well as the lemon quality. So you're adding lemonade, for example. Um, Rattlers, you're adding lemon soda. So you're adding more of the essence and more of the, but there still can be sugar as well. Okay. So let's start off with this. <clears throat> uh, technically, I think it's just a regional thing. Uh, in the United States, we call them shandies. In Europe, they call them Rattlers. Uh, I know Rattlers developed in Germany where they put lemonade into it, but understanding the difference between lemonades is a real key point here that when you're ordering lemonade in Europe, you're getting lemon soda. When you're ordering it in the United States, you're getting lemon juice, sugar, and water. And there is a difference between those two. So 
that's what, where we're talking about there, what Peter's talking about in the shandy, you're adding the lemon juice and the sugar and the lemonade, the U.S. lemonade to it, where the lemon soda is traditionally in the Radler. Yeah, so a lot of it's going to be the sugar, a lot of it's going to be the effervescence or the, uh, you know, everything that's going to come, come along with that sweetness. Um, and I'll also add Radlers, uh, at least in the last handful of years, have grown to include grapefruit, too. Grapefruit's pretty common mm. for rad- Radlers as well. Schaffenhofer. Mm-hmm. No, no, Schaffenhofer mm-hmm. is an actually super delicious beer. It's grapefruit juice. If you want a beer that you literally can drink all day because it is very low alcohol, Schaffenhofer is phenomenal for that. <laughs> Huckleberry Pucker, baby. Yeah. Well, this Shandy version, not the not the actual version of that, which I like the Shandy version, uh, actually. That's a pretty, pretty good beer for me. For those of you who don't know, my very first brewery job was at Paradise Creek Brewing down in Pullman. Who makes Huckleberry Pup- Pucker? Pucker. Um, yeah. So did, uh, I hope everyone's commenting on whether or not you think these are bastards of beer. Um, I kind of think they are. And let's talk about why a lot of people make them, especially in the United States, um, and why they are. But also, I really think that you can make really good. I mean, we, we have made really good shanties before mm-hmm. uh, and really good Rattlers. So let's also kind of dive into why we think they can be a good craft beer as well and how we can make them better. Um, speaking of warm fermentations, which we're talking about all day today because it's hot out there and a lot of people are not going to have temperature control. If you're using the wrong yeast and fermenting it warm, a lot of time it's going to produce some fruitiness, some esterification that maybe you don't want in your beer. And mm-hmm. in the American brewery world, what we've seen a lot of times happen if people aren't satisfied with their beer is their go-to is cover it up with flavors. 100%. Uh, there is a lot of beer out there that tastes like fruit and corn Mm -hmm. for this reason you're like yeah okay cool that was a mistake and it was a mistake to order it um you know which is unfortunate i mean being a professional brewer uh, professional brewery there are costs that you do have to meet and it hurts a lot a lot in a lot of different places to dump a beer down the drain. And if you can just throw huckleberries over it and uh, Pacific Northwest thing, if you just throw huckleberries over it and everybody's going to drink it, whether it's a good beer or not. Yeah. Uh, and I think that this is one of the reasons why a lot of these beers just aren't great because they're not great beers to start out with. That said, I will go ahead and recommend it to those of you who are new brewers that want to make something drinkable out of beers that you might have fermented too warm or made the same mistake on. They do taste, if you're doing Shandies and Rattlers specifically, they're a very easy fix if you have kegs, um, Mm -hmm. and they are a good way to turn a relatively undrinkable into something that you can pawn off onto your friends. Yeah, Uh, which is, I mean, a good way to do. Or maybe a lackluster beer. You're trying to make a light drinkable beer. You're bored of it. It's boring. There's not much going on. You're like, man, there's not excitement coming coming from this beer. I'm not enjoying it. This is actually a pretty good way to make it a lot more enjoyable. Pop your keg top, add a couple of bottles of grapefruit soda in there, or some couple cans of lemonade concentrate, recap it, recarbonate it, and now you have something that you can probably pawn off to your friends. So, yeah. and that's a good summer hack. It's something that a lot of people are going to be able to drink more of because it's got that sweetness and the acidity. It's got everything you want in the summer, but, uh, by nature, that's definitely not making a good beer. So I want to kind of also brainstorm some ideas of how, if you're trying to make a perfect Shandy or Rattler from scratch, what are some things we can do to make that a true craft beer, a beer that we're proud of that we're like, I intended this to be that flavor and it's intriguing enough and quality enough for people that are craft beer lovers to really enjoy and it's not like somebody said in here weird lemonade yeah because that's i mean that's one of my problems with drinking these you drink it and you're like you know this is okay but i would have really rather had the glass of lemonade or the beer by itself right Uh, and there's some great ones out there i mean huckleberry pucker is one of them that comes to mind here locally in town we have one called flostin's paradise or no wait uh, it's not it uh, natural can, 20 makes I it. confuse all their names yeah they're uh, all nerd names oh oh what did I call it um, secondhand paradise oh no that was secondhand robes and Flostin's paradise anyway uh, they make a raspberry blonde and uh, mix it with their house made lemonade which both of them are actually pretty darn good things to start out with and it's phenomenal and I think this is actually one way to elevate the Radler and Shandy's uh, above where they have been is playing with the whole fruit aspect of it 
adding your raspberries to it or mango or you know um, huckleberries like huckleberry pucker on there yeah adding some more dimensions and flavor to these beers i think would be a really good way to do it um and i think it's important to think about what all flavors are going in huckleberry lemonade uh huckleberry grapefruit whatever it's going to be when you're designing the base beer and to make sure the base beer is relatively it was very clean but it's relatively neutral compared to what you're adding so I can think of a couple examples, especially in this warm fermentation, where something like a French Saison could probably blend really well with some of these flavors. Mm -hmm. um, something like the Sac Trois could sometimes blend mm -hmm. really well with maybe some fruitier flavors. So picking a yeast, if you have this warm fermentation, they can complement that. Or just going hyper, hyper neutral, making a temperature controlled uh, American wheat beer, maybe with some spices in it, and then using that as your base before adding the lemonade. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and then adding some spice to it. I think this is actually probably a great way to super elevate some of these beers is taking some other fun things to add to it. Maybe, uh, you know, you have a great grisette in there, adding a little bit of something like pink peppercorns and then lemongrass to it. And now when you're adding your lemonade into it, you're getting all this pop of good spicy flavors coming out of it. That could be actually that tape. That sounds really good to me. right yeah. now. <laughs> and an important distinction here is we're not adding enough lemonade to completely cover up and we're also you notice you said, said grisette we're choosing a relatively dry beer so that the small sugar addition that's going to come from the lemonade for example is going to put that back into a normal like let's say 10 12 sugariness or beer range and so you have a well balanced product with maybe some sim simple sugar components mm -hmm. uh, but that lemon is popping off and it's in a small enough but distinct enough fashion um, where you're going to be be able to express things like pink peppercorns, like lemongrass on top of it. Maybe you're, instead of using like a lemonade where it's just lemon juice and sugar, you're using a little bit of the lemon juice, but a lot of the lemon peel and a little bit of the sugar. Maybe you're playing around with the sugar and you do honey instead. There's a lot of things you can do to kind of build complexity and make it subtle enough that I think a rattler or a, uh, and rattlers are going to be less sugar by themselves. So you could probably have a little bit more play with that, but a rattler or a shandy with something like that could be really, really good. Yeah. Let us I, know what you guys think, by the way, comment if you got ideas on this. I'm excited about it. I want to do it. That's why I put it on there. It might, it might happen. We might do this. Also going into that, <clears throat> what Peter's talking about is using a high quality lemonade or even soda going into this, not going to the store and grabbing the 99 cent Two liter of concentrate. Tree. Oh yeah, that, uh, yeah, yeah. Two, li I mean, two made... liter of this <laughs> squirt. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, Moist. using something really good, making a handmade laminate in there, actually adding the lemon juices, adding the rinds or the oils to it, uh, making it more interesting than actually just hey, here's Minute Maid frozen lemonade concentrate, or I went you know next door to the vending machine and got a two liter of whatever lemon flavored thing there is um that can help elevate it and coming out i think somebody in here mentioned lemon cello uh, adding lemon cello to it and yeah. lemon cello could be very interesting the only concern i would have on that is how sweet lemon cello actually ends up being without uh, enough of the lemon flavor so you'd probably yeah. go lemon cello plus your uh, l you know, lemon uh, essence, lemon rind, lemon bitters, um, mm -hmm. uh, lemon grass, you know, all that stuff. Floater <clears throat> Joe adding some uh, cactus cooler. Like, I actually enjoy that. I don't get yeah. cactus cooler very much, but that is a delicious soda to it. <laughs> uh, you know, Joel, thank you so much for the super chat. Just because. Thank you. Just because. I love that. Thank you. Yay. Thank you, Joel. Um, you know, and switching that out, like I mentioned Schaffenhofer earlier, Schaffenhofer uses uh, grapefruit. Uh, in it. So instead of being a lemonade based Rattler Shandy, it's a grapefruit based uh, Rattler Shandy. And having something like that is just super, super delicious. Uh, we got a lot of great questions um, that I'll address before going to ge into general Q&A. Um, if you guys got more ideas on this, I want to keep hearing those because honestly, like it's just an idea that I was excited about. And so I kind of wanted to bounce it off of all you all. Like I like the idea of the peppercorn, the ideas of lemongrass, everything mm. we've said so far, but we get a lot of our ideas from people just telling us stuff. So if yeah. you want to eventually maybe see your idea happen in beer, it could be now. It could be now. Do it. Could be now. 
Um, but a lot of people talking about stabilizing the yeast before adding sugary components, fruit, etc. Uh, and yes, that, that is something you definitely want to do, especially when you're adding like store-bought lemonade or lemonade concentrate. Um, you want to have your yeast stabilized if you want that sweetness. That said, um, on the homebrew scale, I have purposely made uh, probably more of a Rattler type beer, but by adding the lemonade concentrate purposely during fermentation to dry out the, uh, the sugars, but still add that lemon flavor. So that's that's an option, but the, if you're doing a true shandy, you definitely want to stabilize your yeast first, um, which you can do through sorbates or metabisulfites, or you can do it for, through filtration, which is my preferred method if you've got the equipment, but that takes extra money um, uh, before adding the lemonade. That way I can get exactly what I want out of the final product. Uh, and then we had somebody, Jump Jasper, asked about uh, um, sterilizing fruit. Um, I will almost always mm. freeze and then pasteurize my fruit before adding it to beer. Um, it's just an easy way to make sure it's super sterile and it eliminates risks. So Reverend Gay Wise is a Greyhound <coughs> Shandy. Like that actually sounds really good. Heck yeah. That sounds fantastic. Do it. Send us some. Uh, make that and send us some. How about a salty dog shandy? Ah. Oh, sal- that okay, but isn't that like similar to a gosa? Yeah. Yeah. Until, that would be delicious. Yeah. That would be absolutely delicious in there. Uh and you know i mean even taking this further adding those good spices into it uh and some warming spices too taking a shandy with an amber or a dark saison but then throwing mm-hmm. in like some cardamom maybe some tarragon into that mm. or a little bit of like nutmeg cinnamon and really popping like a winter style shandy out of it um clove and anise i mean mold and lemonade <laughs> first that sounds all right toothpaste and orange juice shandy oh nailed my it God. that's the best right. morning combination ever. if you really want to wake up brush your teeth chug a glass of orange juice that's how that's how you do it <clears throat> let's talk about the mango question that i skipped over earlier uh so adding mangoes um there's two ways to do it so one is just the fact that you're relying on the fact that mangoes have enzymes mangoes in a wheat beer in the mash can actually help lauder your beer it's an inter- interesting quality of mangoes. They actually have protein breaking down enzymes as well as amylase enzymes. And so uh, if you pulverize some fresh mangoes and add that into your mash, it can actually help with the lottering and actually help extraction. Your flavor, though, won't be great. If you really want mango flavor, there's no other way around it. Like any other fruit, you got to, first of all, cut off the pit, cut off the skins, um, get a super, super ripe mango and uh, freeze and pasteurize it. You really want to concentrate those sugars and get all the sugars out of the cell walls. And so um, you really need to either have a really good puree that's already ready to go. Um, and even then, I, a lot of purees, boiling them down a little bit can concentrate that flavor. So there's a lot of ways to do it, but I always like doing that processing step to concentrate the flavors before I add it so that I'm getting the maximum amount of fruit flavor without affecting the volume too much. Yeah. Uh, how hard to make a Saison that is close <clears throat> to a stout and porter? Uh, honestly, not that hard. It's well within the styles, uh, the style of Saison. That's yep. just dark Saison. One thing you have to remember about these is the stouts and porters are generally much sweeter than a Saison is going to be. So while you're using a big bill of roasty and thick full malts on that, in the dark Saisons, you don't need those extra roasted malts. Using something like Black Prince or Carafa would give you a better flavor in the dark saison than say using roast barley or uh, black patent for sure yep the dryness is going to add extra stringency to those dark malts so switch your uh, thinking around a little bit make sure that you're using malts that will account for that extra dryness in there as well as the extra spiciness and pepperiness coming out of the yeast and it's not that hard Reverend K.Y., what about those salted sugar dried mango Mexican treats in the boil? Um, That might Those actually work work pretty well. Uh, I've done them before. One of the reasons that that, uh, at the end of the boil, mm, I don't like adding fruit in at the end of the boil. I think it adds some uh, flavors that I'm not particularly fond of and can drive off volatile aromatics. But I have used those dried mango slices in uh, beer before, and it worked pretty decently because when they dry them out, it concentrates a lot of the flavors uh, into those slices. You do have extra sugar going on in there, uh, so you do have to be careful of that. But it's it's a decent substitute if you can't get good fresh mango. I feel like I'd, I feel like you'd have to use a decent amount of it. So I'd, I'd wonder about the salt content, and then I'd also wonder about 
during fermentation how much of that mango flavor is going to stick around. I could see it working, but the only thing that I've really done that dried any sort of dried candy things is ginger, and that works really well, but it's ginger, so it's got a really strong flavor by itself. Um, mango, I don't know how much flavor it's going to have. It, I had <clears> to use a lot of them. I mean, I used like a Costco-sized bag in a five-gallon batch for that. Um, and it, I, I used the Costco dried one, so it's literally just dried mango and sugar on it didn't have any salt content or any extra flavoring um, but you know try it out make it and send it to us i want a saison for the summer how long should i age my saison uh to let the diastaticus dry out the beer uh, a lot of it will happen quick depending on your grist so if you've got a complex grist it might be a little bit longer but you can i mean you can make a great saison that'll ferment down to 1006 in two weeks um, that said if you bottle it after that expect it to still go more and more and more dry which isn't a bad thing you're just going to end up with a highly carbonated bottle uh also keep in mind that different saison strains ferment at different speeds uh, french saison <clears throat> is known for being stupidly fast where bell saison can uh, act it has been reported in a few different times to stop during mid fermentation and then continue fermenting down after that um, so not all Saison strains perform the same way, but especially in warmer weather, they should be pretty darn quick for you. What about mangoes with chili powder added? I only, mm. uh, when I'm using chili powder, I only cook with chili powder when I'm making meth. Um, it's my secret ingredient, a little bit of chili pea. Um, that said, I make a lot of money off of it. So try uh, it. Jimmy, that's actually something that I want to do. Make meth um, with chili powder? Yes. <laughs> that way, you know, when you, when you snort it, it just burns your sinuses out. But using uh, mango chilies, I, it's a treat that I absolutely love in Mexico. You get a fresh mango. You know, guys out on the beach are selling it to you. Slice off the skin, put a little lime juice on it, throw some tahini over it, and eat that. It's so all darn delicious. Um, yeah, go for it. I mean, dried chili powder is not going to have... Uh, well, it shouldn't have any of the preservatives. It shouldn't have extra salts or anything like that in it. So that should probably be all right. That should be tasty. I know we're stuck on mangoes. What percentage of our audience do you think needs to buy mangoes anyway just for relationship practice? Mm. I mean, I just need to buy a mango <laughs> to put in my face. That, mm. we, we, yeah, we've all, yep, we're there. Um, yeah. uh, uh, somebody's asking about kefir and uh, will kefir ferment in beer or will it, kill the yeast um beer yeast will kill kefir grains they will not survive there's i mean there's not enough hardy bacteria in kefir grains to survive in any beer whatsoever um and it and kefir grains will not ferment beer especially hopped beer so kefir kefir grains are very very uh mild and not very hardy cultures yeah they, they make some really tasty stuff when they're making kefir, when they're fermenting some milk or some water, depending on what you're doing, but yeah. Uh, I mean, I do know a lot of people that have used uh, kefir um, in different beers and things like that, but most of the time when I've heard about that, they're using it first as a solo strain and then adding in yeast afterwards. Um, no experience with it. I think I've seen I, people blend kefir into beer, beer, but yeah, usually not. It's not a ferment in the actual beer. Yeah. Um, Kevin Rabe, do you have to pasteurize or do you, yeah, do you have to pasteurize bags of frozen fruit or just throw it in secondary? You're probably fine just throwing it into secondary. That says, that said, Tim usually just throws it in. I usually pasteurize it. It probably doesn't make a huge difference. I just like that extra concentration, the caramelization of sugars that I get from pasteurizing and a little bit of extra peace of mind. Because yeah. a lot of times if I have bags of frozen fruit, those bags have been in my freezer with fish and whatever All else that extra stuff uh, I, if they are in sealed bags here's the deal about that even if they're in sealed bags from the store there's a lot of things that are perfectly fine for you to eat and they will give you absolutely no problem so uh, the company or manufacturers don't have to worry about it being on the fruit but if it goes into the beer it is going to make it bad uh, so making sure that your fruit is sterile in one way or another first is always the best option. Um, 
some of the things, I mean, when Peter's talking the difference that I don't like to boil it first, I don't like to reduce it down first most of the time, unless I'm going specifically for that flavor because it does give you that cooked fruit, that reduced fruit flavor, baked fruit flavor. Uh, so if I'm going for a fresh fruit flavor, a lot of the time it's just a nice quick up to a pasteurization temperature, drop it back down. But there's other times, one of our best uh, sour IPAs that we've done, I actually took blackberries, I mean a bunch of blackberries, and I reduced those down on a low heat for a long time, really trying to make yummy, a yummy. blackberry pie type of flavor coming out of it. And it, it was, it was delicious. Sean Huntley, there's a meadery near me that has a habanero pear cider. Send me one. Marte, what do you think about the Omega brand of yeast? Looks like some of them have higher fermentation temperature ranges. We love Omega. We honestly probably mostly just use them for their specialty yeasts, i.e. Sundew, uh, a lot of their branded yeasts, Yovaru, um, Hornadol, uh, Bonanza, uh, Lutra, a lot of those really hot topic branded yeasts. We still use Imperial for a lot of our regular yeasts, mostly because they're close to us. Um, so not for any other reason. I haven't tried a lot of their, uh, like I haven't tried Omega's Chico strain, for example, just because we haven't really had a reason to. So yeah. Don't know about that. Yeast and the Beast. Homebrew for Life is only 400 subs away from us. They're closing the distance. Um, somebody just needs to go onto Fiverr and hire someone to auto sub us from like some third world country. That's right. Uh, Ruindu, <clears throat> uh, sorry this got buried. Have you guys tried brewing any lagers with weird malts, such a hundred percent of the bill uh, as a hundred percent of the bill, such as oat malt or wheat malt? Um, I we have actually brewed an absolutely incredible lager with uh, golden naked oats as what was it thirty forty percent of yeah, the malt this bill? Thing was forty. Yeah, it was super good. Uh, one thing I'm going to say about that is you are going to need some enzymes. Definitely. And a lot of muscle power. Yeah. But that could be extremely good. I mean, in all honesty, you have tons of historical accounts where wheat was the preferred grain to use for brewing rather than barley because it tasted so much better. Yeah. Um, and then through, you know, wars and governments restricting things uh barley turned into what we were actually using uh i would say go for it the oat might i mean i would definitely try it but oat having the uh, higher fat and oil contents to it i would be worried about that being a little bit too meaty and slick i have done a 100 percent wheat malt beer it was just a half of american style hefeweizen so not a um not 100 percent wheat malt lager that said it was very very clean surprisingly like it was a good beer um, yeah, I still prefer 50, 50, like most people do, but hundred percent wheat works. All right. Yeah, you, uh, I mean, answer maybe one or two it. more questions and close it up. I'm going right. to go pee and then hit the end button thing. Ideas when, uh, adding fresh jalapenos, I slice them up and added the vodka to dump in. I like that idea. Adding it to vodka, making a tincture uh, is always the most controllable way to do it. Uh, one thing with fresh jalapenos is be, uh, depending on, the meatiness of the flesh in there if you do have a lot of flesh a lot of the actual meat of the jalapeno you can get some vegetal flavors coming out of it some of that green pepper coming out of it well you know you're putting peppers into it and it is desirable to some level try you know it can go overboard pretty quickly so i like the tincture idea that's one of my favorite ways uh to add actually anything is tinctures are so controllable and they give you a consistent reliable uh flavor additive to it i like doing that um that being said, I mean, smoke a couple of the jalapenos and throw them in there. That would be super delicious. Uh, we have a brewery in town that does a great jalapeno beer, and they actually use pickled jalapenos for that. And that's an awesome flavor as well. It gives you that extra little punchiness coming out of it. So, uh, yeah, go for it. I, I would add them in secondary is where I would add them. You know, pasteurize it a little bit, add it in secondary, and away you go. Okay. Uh, boop, 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 boop. Reverend, thank you so much for the super chat. Uh, a round of cheers to the wicked Powhatan founder, Terry Burleson, homebrew store. Term Pro Brewer. Like y'all, the Island. May he rest in peace. I'll be sending more people to the GSP. Thank you, all. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
if you didn't hear Peter over there, uh, Reverend KY, round of cheers to Wicked uh, Two Ton uh, founder Terry Boyce. I'm saying that wrong. Homebrew store owner, pro beer just like us, but on an island. May he rest in peace and may he rest in peace. I will drink a beer for him. Thank you, KY, for sending people over. It's always great when uh, when you do enjoy it. Um, thank you, thank you, everybody, for tuning in to. Wow. I am lost right now. Anyway, thanks for tuning in today. We appreciate you spending your Sunday mornings, evenings. It might even be Monday in some places. I don't know. Uh, thanks for being with us. Make sure to like the video. Make sure to subscribe to our main channel, the Second Genus Not Brewing channel. Go over to Facebook, Instagram. Give us a like, maybe a comment on something like that. Let's work those algorithms a little bit. Uh, hit up the TikTok. Join our Discord for specific questions if you have them or just want to, you know, get on there and chat at other people in the homebrewing community. Um, yeah, thank you very much. We appreciate having you here and uh, we look forward to all of the super delicious shandies and rattlers that you are going to send us now. And actually, going back through that, uh, who asked about the jalapenos? Was that nocturnal? Jalapeno, uh, yeah, nocturnal, a jalapeno rattler. That sounds amazing right now. You should make that and then send it to us. Or even better yet, make a jalapeno cilantro rattler, but instead of lemon juice or uh, lemonade, use some limeade for it. And that would be so good. So good. All right. Thanks for uh, tuning in, guys. We will see you next week right here for another edition of the Genus Podcast. Cheers.